Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk to you today about our MapRiter photolithography tool. My name is Anthony and I'm Senior Application Scientist at Peran Magneto Optics. The talk will be divided into three sections. In the first section, I will present the machine from a hardware point of view. I will explain the technology used to expose a pattern and I will highlight a few of the key specs of the machine. In the second part, I will focus a little more on the application side and show you a non-exhaustive list of possible applications and devices that can be made with the system. And finally, I will give you a brief introduction to our software to give you an idea of how simple it is to set an exposure going. Simple, yet powerful. So buckle up and let's embark on a journey inside the MacWriter 3. Let's first see what maskless photolithography is about. These are simple schematics depicting the more traditional approach to optical lithography using a mask aligner on the left and the more modern maskless lithography using a macro writer on the right. The conventional approach to photolithography is usually based on exposing through a chromium glass mask manufactured by specialist vendors. The method is not very flexible. If there's a mistake in the mask, or if the user wants to make small modifications to the design, they will need to purchase a new mask, which can cost a few hundred dollars and which can take many days to be manufactured. Mask hangers have limited resolutions. In order to achieve best resolution, the wafer needs to be in contact with the mask, which is not always possible and the flow of nitrogen is often required. Machines with sub-micron resolutions are not easy to find um, and they're not cheap. Grayscale is not easily achieved. The light source being fully on or fully off, it is not straightforward to partially expose photoresist with mask aligners. Aligning the sample can be very tricky especially in a multi-step process where the exposure needs to be carefully aligned to previously designed alignment marks. I have seen students spend three hours or more trying to position their wafer very precisely. But once the alignment is done, or even better, if no particular alignment is required, the throughput is very high. In one flash of the UV light, a large wafer can be fully exposed. Direct right lithography tools overcome these issues by holding the mask in software. The mask is designed with a layout editor software such as AutoCAD and the pattern is sent directly from the computer to the miniature display unit that projects the design file onto the substrate. The flexibility is excellent. The design file can be modified in minutes and the new exposure can be launched straight away without having to pay for expensive masks or wait for the mask to be manufactured. The MacroWriter has a maximum resolution of 0.4 micron, uh, which is not easily achievable with a, a, a traditional mask aligner. Grayscale exposures are really easy to set up and Alignment to up to four markers is extremely straightforward, quick, and easy. However, the throughput is not as high as with a mask aligner. This is why the macro writer is better suited for an R&D environment or for an academic research group. So now let's open the front door and look at, let's look at what's under the bonnet. The machine has a modular conception where each module can easily be disconnected from the rest of the system, which makes diagnostics and repairs very easy. Modules include optics units, interferometer, XY stage, control electronics, and so on. The optics is hidden behind the red cover, 
which prevents the user from ever being at risk of seeing the high power UV light. This short video shows you the technology uh, that is used to transfer the mask from the computer to the chip. The MacroWriter makes use of a DLP chip, where DLP stands for Digital Light Processor. It is a microchip, usually found in video projectors, composed of a million micromirrors, depicted in blue in the video. On either side of the DLP chip, there is a yellow, li a yellow light source used for the illumination of the microscope camera, and a UV light source used to expose the photoresist. Each mirror can either be oriented towards the yellow light or towards the UV light. In the video, the projected plane corresponds to the sample plane. When all the mirrors point towards the yellow light, the projected plane is all yellow and the photoresist is not exposed. When mirrors point towards the UV light, only the selected mirrors are projected onto the sample plane. So this is how on and off pixels are generated by a clever orientation of each DLP mirror. Here, in one flash of the UV light, we expose 1 million pixels. Then the XY stage moves and another 1 million pixels are exposed. And the stage moves again and we expose another 1 million pixels, and so on. This slide summarizes the different characteristics related to that optics module. You can see that up to five objectives can be selected, resulting in five microscope magnifications when imaging the sample, but also five writing resolutions when exposing. If you look at the bottom line that says system, you can see that different systems have a different number of exposure resolutions available. And I'd like to take a moment now to talk you through those different systems. The MacRiter 3 family comes in four different flavors. We have the Baby, the Baby Plus, the Misa, and the Pro. Now, Let's take a look at what the system looks like. This is the baby, our entry-level machine. It is small, compact, and fits on any table or workbench. For better performance, we have designed the Baby Plus. For even better performance, we have the Misa. And for full capability, we have the Pro system. Okay, I'll give you 10 seconds or so to spot the differences between those four systems. And the answer is quite obvious. Um, apart from the optical table for the MacRiter 3 Pro, those systems are absolutely identical. If we now look at the price range, um, we see that it will only cost you five gold coins to purchase a baby and a little more to purchase a baby plus and a little more for the Misa and a little more for the Pro. Those four systems sharing the same skeleton and being extremely modular, there is a very natural and easy upgrade path. So if your budget is only five gold coins now, you can buy the cheap entry-level machine and slowly work your way up the upgrade path without having to change machine or without having to return the machine to us, which is, which is pretty good. So coming back to the characteristics of the optics, we offer the choice between three wavelengths, 405, 385 and 365 nanometers. 365 nanometers is perfect for photoresist like SU8. Um, we also have a wide range of resolutions, ranging between 5 micron down to 0 0.4 micron. The entry-level machine, the baby, only has one resolution available. 
The Baby Plus has two resolutions available. The Misa has got three. And finally, the Pro offers all standard resolutions. The Pro can also be equipped with a x50 lens that makes it possible to expose 400 nanometer wide structures. The top image shows 400 nanometer wide lines separated by 1.4 microns, and the bottom picture shows 400 nanometer dots. Another module I'd like to mention today is the interferometer module. The position of the XY stage is carefully controlled by a, an interferometer system that we design in-house. Uh, it has a maximum resolution of 1 nanometer and the minimum step size for the XY stage is 4 nanometers. We achieve excellent overlay alignment accuracy of plus or minus 500 nanometers over the entire writing area, even when the machine is used in combination with other lithography tools such as electron beam or another mask aligner. This is a test um, showing the quality of the alignments across a 6-inch wafer. In the first exposure, we position the four alignment markers represented by the blue boxes and one half of the vernier test pattern in red. After developing the wafer, we put it back into the macro writer. We locate the four markers to realign the wafer and we expose the second half of the vernier test. This way, we can quantify precisely the overlay alignment accuracy at the chosen north, south, east, west, and middle positions. And as you can see, it gives excellent results everywhere on the 6-inch wafer. So this concludes the brief introduction to the MacroWriter hardware. Of course, um, there will be much more to say. Uh, but we've only got 45 minutes or so today. I, I could talk for hours and hours about the, the hardware, so let's, let's keep it short. I'd like to move on now to the applications points, uh, the applications parts of this presentation. This is the wafer truck where you put down your samples. The maximum wafer size is 230 millimeters by 230 millimeters by 15 millimeters with the possibility to go up to 300 millimeters through customization. There is absolutely no limit to the minimum sample size. It can be one millimeter by one millimeter or even smaller. There is no need for vacuum and any sample shape can be loaded into the machine. Square chips, circular wafers, even that oddly shaped piece when you try to neatly cut your wafer but the crack decides to follow a different direction. The system can take multiple wafers at once, like the five pieces on the wafer truck right now. Each chip can have its own system of coordinates and its own job list. Uh, this is very useful for mul when multiple users want to use the system overnight uh, for example. Now, let's now look at the different possible applications for the system. Microfluidics is a popular field of research where the MacroWriters reveals itself a very useful tool. We can expose very thick negative photoresist and some of our customers regularly work with thicknesses of resist above 100 microns. The possibility to have a 365 nanometer light source makes the system compatible with SUA resist, uh, which has become a reference resist in the field of microfluidics. The top three images show the different parts of a microfluidic device with the injection points on the left, the long propagation channels, 
and the outlet region on the right. Um, in this picture, the bottom channel is only 2 micrometer wide. The bottom right image uh, comes from one of our customers and shows a device obtained after a two-step process where two different thicknesses of SU8 were exposed. You can see deep trenches in yellow and less deep bars running across the trenches uh, made of thinner SU8. I like this image a lot um, and it shows that complex processes can be achieved with our system. The next application I'd like to show you is the ability to expose grayscale structures. You're probably familiar with grayscale exposures, but if you're not, I've got these very simple schematics to show you what it is. If we first focus on the left-hand side picture, it is a straightforward black and white image of a circle. If we load this image into our software and look at the dose profile along the orange line passing through the center of the circle, the system would apply no dose in the black region and full dose where the image is white. This results in a very abrupt dose profile with only two values possible, 0% and 100%. As a consequence, the resulting hole or pillar, depending on the polarity of the photoresist, uh, will have straight near vertical walls. Now, looking at the right hand side picture, if we load an image where we don't go abruptly from black to white, but rather through a gradient of gray levels, we can induce a dose response which is not binary. Any level of gray between fully black and fully white will receive a fraction of the total dose, allowing the user to pattern three-dimensional shapes, as we can see on those SCM images. This ability finds a useful application in the fabrication of microlens arrays or Fresnel lenses and other diffraction gratings. By controlling the grayscale gradient at the design file level, we can obtain micro lenses with different curvatures, as you can see in the top left and the top right images. This image here shows an array of rectangular structures receiving different grayscale doses. The grayscale level goes up from right to left and so is the thickness of the element. Finally, the bottom right image shows that we can easily cover large areas with closely packed microlens. The next application I'd like to mention is 2D materials, with the emphasis on randomly distributed objects. Here we have a selection of flakes, graphene, molybdenum disulfide, and bismuth telluride crystal. Um, here the crystal is just 100 micrometer in size and it's got six contacts on it. The common point between those five images, apart from showing very small structures, is the random distribution of those flakes. The random distribution is inherent to the process by which the flakes are transferred to the silicon chip, typically by exfoliation using regular cello tape. And this random distribution cannot be avoided. So let me show you briefly how the macro writer can be used to contact such flakes. First, we want to locate the, flake of it, the flakes of interest on the real-time microscope window and we want to export that frame as a bitmap file. With the highest magnification of the Macrowriter Pro, 
we can easily image sub-microphone structures. Also, it's important to know that for graphene flakes, um, flakes that are exfoliated on silicon substrate, we can differentiate with the macro with the macrowriter camera. We can differentiate monolayers from bilayers and, and thicker flakes. Usually, for some applications, um, we want to contact monolayers. Then you can either open the bitmap image with a bitmap editor, like Paint, and draw your contact directly inside the bitmap. Or you can import the file into Cluin. Cluin is a layout editor software we work with, um, and it has the ability to turn bitmap images into vector objects. By doing so, you can um, by doing so, you can draw your contacts on top of the flake you chose. In this image, we have designed three layers: a layer in yellow for the very narrow contacts, a layer in blue for wider contacts, and a layer in gray for big fat contact pads. Mm -hmm. The newly created file can then be saved and opened in the MacroWriter software. And the software tool called Virtual Mask Langer, or VMA, can be used to show that the contacts are going to be exposed in the right place. The Virtual Mask Langer is a feature whereby the exposure to come can be visualized first in the microscope view in order to make sure everything is in the right place. If there is some minor misalignment, it can be corrected just before launching the exposure. And then, final step, we can perform the exposure and boom shakalaka, there we have nice contacts on the, the flake we chose. Mm -hmm. The next popular application for the MacroWriter is in microelectronics. The top left image shows a horizontal wire, which was designed by electron beam lithography, and electrical contact superimposed on top of the macro wire. Then in the middle picture, uh, we have a planar inductor composed of five micrometer wires separated by 10 microns. Then on the top right, uh, we have a honeycomb lattice, which is composed of a 2 micrometer wide channel. Bottom right, there is also a spiral inductor. And on the left, there's another example of electrical contacts at both ends of macro wires. The world of microelectronics is vast, um, and there are plenty more device possibilities. Some other applications, uh, the MacroWriter can also be used to design QR codes or randomized security patterns, as we can see here on these microscopy images and SEM um, images. Or the machine can also be used uh, to design fun stuff, um, like a teeny tiny Mona Lisa. So this image is roughly 200 micrometer in size. Um, this next picture is a photo of the owner of the company. I really, really hope it's not in the audience today. Um, I'm not sure it'd be too happy to, to see this. Um, and this next picture uh, is a picture of my team from a few years back uh, when we went planting trees um, on Earth Day. So there is many things you can design with the MacroWriter. This, this was just a brief list of potential applications um, and, and just to show you that the machine is truly versatile. Physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, um, it's pretty huge. Um, now, I think that all the images I showed you so far were devices fabricated on silicon chips. 
So you might wonder if there's any constraint on the type of substrate that is used. My answer would be not really. Um, I'm showing you here on this slide a selection of substrates that are commonly used by our users. Of course, there's the, the good old silicon and silicon dioxide. Um, you can also easily pattern on glass, sapphire or quartz substrates. Rough surfaces such as aluminum nitride ceramics are happy to be used as well. Uh, the bottom left image shows an exposure done on a diamond where you see it from the, the top view and you can see the shape of the diamond. Um, that was pretty amazing to expose, I have to admit. The last example, the bottom right picture, um, I was quite amazed to see it when I, when I was on site with, uh, with the customer. This was done by a user at JNU University in New Delhi. Uh, where they poured a viscous li liquid polymer into a petri dish and they poured a lot. There was maybe three millimeters or four millimeters of resist inside the petri dish and then they put the petri dish inside the macrolide and they exposed an array of this pattern that you can see uh, which is composed of five squares and a, and a number one and when they took the sample out of the machine the exposed polymer had hardened. So basically there we were in this petri dish, there were solidified square blocks, literally solidified, floating in this sea of viscous polymer. Um, it, it was pretty amazing to, to witness that. Don't ask me what the application was. I couldn't answer you. Uh, it was just really, really fun to watch. Again, this is just a short list of substrates. Um, there are many more substrates that can be used successfully with the Macrolide. Once again, I just wanted to show you the versatility of the, of the machine. So this concludes part number two of my presentation. I would like now to show you briefly the software interface. Uh, but before I do so, I would like to emphasize that 40% of our employees have a PhD degree and have a strong academic background. It's with this knowledge of how the academic world works that we design our machines, both hardware and software. We try to make it simple and straightforward so any PhD student can quickly learn how to use the, the machine, but it is packed with advanced features for the more expert users. Also, as a small yet mature company, we are always eager to receive feedback, good or bad. This is the best way for a company like us to grow um, and to improve the quality of our systems. Okay, so let's take a look at our software. In this video, I will show you how to start a simple exposure. So when you start the software, you will always be presented with that real-time microscope window where you can visualize your sample. On the left side, there are three panels that you have to visit one after the other before launching your exposure. A Lang wafer, creeper pattern and expose. So we always start with a Lang wafer. This is where you can see the sample surface. Um, you can make X moves y moves as well as a virtual theta rotation there is no theta stage but the rotation is only virtual you can control the z stage by changing the value in this thickness box and you can choose the magnification from the magnification drop down menu so the first step is to find the surface of your sample and to focus on it the silicon chip currently in the machine is roughly 600 micrometer thick so i start with a thickness of 600 micrometer I can see a piece of dust that I can use to improve the focus. By scrolling up or down with the mouse, I can move the Z stage up or down until my piece of dust appears sharp. <coughs> this happens for a thickness of 634 micron. To get a more accurate value, I can click on the autofocus button. The DLP chip then projects this checkerboard pattern. And as the Z stage goes up and down, the pattern slowly comes into focus. 
and here the thickness of my silicon chip is about 635 micrometer. Um, I can choose the to image with a different magnification. I'm using a pro system here, so I have four magnifications to choose from. Uh, by selecting a magnification, the turret motor is rotating until the right objective is in place and the microscope image remains in focus, as you can see in the image right here. In addition to the four available magnifications, uh, there is a digital times four zoom. And if the substrate is too reflective and the camera saturates, it is possible to decrease the brightness of the yellow illumination by sliding the cursor as I'm doing right now. Here in the bottom right corner, there is the quick access corner with some of the most uh, used features in the software. So the first button opens the center wafer window. In this window, the user can make use of up to four markers in order to define their own user origin and not, not be bound to the, the machine's origin. The second button um, opens the wide field viewer window where we can stitch together camera images. This is particularly useful when looking for a special feature or a marker on the sample. When the feature of interest is found, uh, let's say the speck of dust here in the top left corner, we can simply double click on it and the XY stage will move to that position. And this is how we can move the XY stage. Any double click on the main microscope window will move the stage to the clicked position. To move long distances out of the field of view, we can use the XY boxes up there. So if I put 2020, the stage will go 20 millimeter in X, 20 millimeter in Y, with respect to the user origin. Uh, so Erlang Wafer is where we focus on the sample and decide to modify or not the machine's origin. Then we go to prepare pattern. This is the space where we define the job list and the exposure conditions for each individual job. So let me open the job. Uh, this is a vector file. This is a .cif vector file. The software can open CIF or GDS files as well as any pixel-based format. Here, in the layer section, we can see that the CIF file is composed of three layers, layer 0, layer 1, and layer 2, layer 3, sorry. For each job, a quality parameter can be chosen right here. A dose correction as well as a focus correction can be applied in these boxes. The exposure resolution is chosen from the drop-down menu from 0.6 micron to 5 micrometer. And the wavelength available for this system is 385 nanometers. And the user can then choose the exposure mode between normal, vector and grayscale. Grayscale is the mode to select to make the nice curved structures I showed you earlier. So let's simulate an exposure of three layers of the SIF file. Uh, so I need to open three jobs, one job per layer. So let's open three times the same file and let's make job one layer zero that we expose with a resolution of five micrometer. Let's now assign layer one to job number two. And because the design is narrow micro wires, let's use a resolution of one micron for that job. Now let's assign layer 3 to job number 3 because this is a small dot of 20 microns in size. Let's choose to expose it with the 0.6 micron resolution. So now we have designed our job list and chosen the right exposure parameters. So let's move on to the exposure window. This is where the global dose and focus can be chosen. Uh, the dose or resist sensitivity is in millijoules per square centimeter, so let's make it 100 and let's keep the focus correction at 0 micron. Here you can see the focus lock is disabled. We can enable this feature by double clicking on the traffic light button. Focus lock automatically chooses a number of locations across the exposed area and makes a local surface height measurement. This is to track and correct any surface slope and bow. For the purpose of this demo, I'll keep it off. 
When we're ready, we simply have to click the green traffic light button to set the exposure going right now. The system exposes job one with a five micron lens, as you can see right now. I've chosen five micron this, because this is a uh, big contact that don't require any small features. The system, um, when, when the exposure is finished, the system will rotate the turret to engage the one micrometer lens and expose job number two in the job list. That is done. And finally, the turret engages the 0 0.6 micron lens and it will expose, it's done it now, it's exposed um, job number three, the small box. So there is absolutely no action required from the user. Everything is automated. There is no need to open the machine and change optics units. Everything is selected through the various drop-down menus I just showed you. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, as we say here. Um, so this is it for the software demo. Um, before finishing this webinar, I would like to talk to you about Durham Magneto Optics. The company was founded 18 years ago as a spin-off from Professor Carbon's group at Durham University in the UK. The first product we commercialized was a Magneto Optical Curve Effect Magnetometer for the characterization of magnetic thin films. About five, six years ago, we decided to broaden the company's horizon by expanding towards sample fabrication and photo lithography. In 18 years, we have sold over 160 machines across 26 countries. Um, and to help us manage such a high demand, we have always worked um, closely with Quantum Design, who is always providing excellent local technical support. So wherever, wherever you are, there is local technical support not far away. And for countries or regions where QD is not implanted, we have other strong, knowledgeable partners, ATSL in Israel, Optics in the Czech Republic, and Domo Technica in Australia. This is a map showing where our 160 machines are currently implanted with some of our key customers. Blue dots represent macro writers and red dots show the magnetometers that really started the, the company. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention um, and I hope you really enjoyed your journey inside the MacroWriter 3. Thank you.